Welcome to episode number five of Ask Concussion Doc. A few things to talk about today. Uh, first of all, go Leafs go. Go Leafs go. Leafs are in Boston tonight, game seven. Pretty exciting. For those of us in Toronto, for those of you in Boston, it's going to be tough to lose at home. Um, having some good weather finally, which is good. Spring sports are starting up, which is awesome. So uh, just sharing some news from Complete Concussion Management and some of the things that we are working on. Um, our clinics this year are working with more sports organizations than ever, which is great to see that sports orgs are finally starting to take concussion seriously and developing their concussion protocols. We work with a lot of football, soccer, rugby, lacrosse, uh, gymnastics, um, even cheerleading uh, sports that you probably wouldn't consider to have a lot of concussions. Uh, there's a lot of uh, those organizations coming to the forefront, which is excellent to see. And with all the stuff that we're doing with social media and working with clinics and things like that, um, one of the questions that we have gotten recently is just, you know, what is complete concussion management? What are we all about? Where did we start from? How did we come to be? And uh, so I wanted to address that question in, in this uh, particular episode. So I'll start off with a little bit of a background on myself. Um, I am, first I went to Kinesio Western and then I went to uh, uh, CMCC here in Toronto, which is Chiropractic College. And as I was going through Cairo, I was always interested in the sports medicine angle. That's kind of my background and where I came from. So I ended up doing a two-year postdoctorate fellowship in uh, sports medicine. And with that particular uh, residency program, what you have to do is an original research project. And it was right around the time of Sidney Crosby's injury. And so I got really interested in concussions and concussion rehabilitation from that standpoint. And so that became the focus my entire research thesis and I ended up working down at the University of Buffalo with John Letty and Barry Willer um, and we we're looking at actually concussion versus whiplash being as a chiropractor myself I'm, I'm interested in how the neck symptoms would play into uh, very similar symptoms as concussion and what we found obviously is there's, there's tremendous overlap between these two conditions but because I had a myself in the research surrounding concussion and basically devoted you know two straight years to studying this topic um, I realized that what we were supposed to be doing as healthcare practitioners according to the best literature that was out there was so far away from what was actually being done right people still relying on symptom-based approach in order to kind of clear athletes back to play people not providing rehab people still promoting this kind of rest mentality and because you know, I was so into this and I just realized there was this huge gap. I started a concussion program at one of my clinics here in Toronto and very quickly we had people getting referred from all over, you know, southern Ontario by as much as, you know, three to four hours away driving to see me. And when you're coming in and you're going through rehab and, you know, a, a, a ton of these patients have vestibular issues, and visual issues, and they have trouble riding in cars and these types of things. And patients would always ask, this is great but I hate the car. I have to drive two hours each way to see you. Is there anything that, is there anyone closer to me that does what you do? And I never really had a good answer for them because I could never really find any of these clinics. And so I kind of had the idea of let's start training other people with the evidence that's available. Let's start training the therapist because concussion is, it's not covered in medical schools. That's a shocker for a lot of people. Concussion is not on the curriculum at most medical schools. Uh, at least it wasn't when I started and may have improved now. It's not covered in physiotherapy programs. It's not covered in chiropractic programs. And so for the most part, the majority of practitioners that are out there in the field have absolutely zero training or knowledge around concussion. It's kind of this mysterious thing that everyone just assumes that, well, we don't know anything about it because we never learned anything about it. But that's actually not the case. There's actually a lot of research on concussion. There's probably you know close to 100 studies a month that are published on this topic. And we do know a lot. I mean, there's a lot that we don't know, but there's a lot that we do, and there's a lot of things that can help. And so the idea was let's train other clinics to be able to provide this evidence-based care, but at the same time, let's utilize this as a research tool coming from a research background. So at the same time, let's collect data. Um, so we developed our own kind of concussion database system, which is now one of the largest concussion database systems in world. Now let's connect that database system with smartphone technology. So now we have apps for coaches on the sidelines, for trainers on the sidelines, right? For those of you therapists that work with teams, you know, you're carrying around a binder full of scats 
everywhere you go. And if the player gets injured, now you're rifling through trying to figure this out. But we put it all onto the application. So any type of baseline uh, assessment that's been done at any one of our partnered clinics now gets stored on this electronic database system. So the athlete themselves has their baseline results year after year, but also the therapist on the sidelines can access that through their own app. They can report those injuries directly into one of our certified clinics, and that injury report goes through right away. So now that the trained clinician uh, can actually see that, so physicians, uh, chiros, physios, whoever is, is, is at that clinic can see, here's the injury report that's coming in from the trainer, you know what the symptoms were on the sidelines. We can look and get them in right away so we fast track that uh, management. And so the whole idea was let's not just run courses and teach people things, but let's actually set up a network. Let's set up a network of trained clinics that know what they're doing, that are up to date on all the best evidence for acute management, return to learn, return to work, how to get somebody back into sport better, how to utilize physical exertion testing uh, when making clearance decisions, what are the best baseline parameters. Let's form the standardized approach for the acute care, but also teach everybody about all the rehab and stuff that has to happen at the back end so that in the event these injuries drag on a little bit, we know how to treat them, the best evidence, and we update it every single month. So in Canada, this started back in 2014, and we now have about 200 clinics in Canada within our network, and we work with a large body organizations across the country. Uh, we do all the preseason testing for some of the Olympic teams and some professional leagues as well. Um, and then any injuries that happen, they get filtered into our clinic. And the application, the coaches now know what's going on with the management, and there's a communication line with our technology and the smartphone apps on the sidelines. And so this year now, we've now, you know, just started moving into the U.S., which is awesome. We started in uh, around January, just kind of reaching out, looking for the right clinics that fit our model. So we're looking for kind of multidisciplinary clinics that already treat kind of athletes that see concussion patients. They may already have a concussion program in place. Um, and we're looking to help them expand that and help to keep them informed and on top of the research, but also bring them into our network so that we have a reliable clinic in all these different areas so that we can work with statewide organizations as well as national organizations to have a consistent program across the board because everyone's doing different things and to try and get something unified uh, on a larger scale is what is needed. And this has kind of been our mission uh, since day one. So um, moving into the U.S. this year, now we have about 20 clinics that we form partnerships with. A lot of them are going through their training kind of right now. And, um, and that's super exciting for us to go international. We also started in Australia around the same time. And we're, we have about 15 clinics in Australia now that are, that are coming on. And so the idea is to form this global network of clinics so that if athletes travel, uh, if you're out of the country and you happen to get injured, you can go into any one of our clinics and show your ID card, and they can pull up your baseline history. They can pull up your concussion file, and it keeps everything consistent. You know what you're getting. You know you're getting the best, and that's that's the idea, and that's the vision of complete concussion management. And so anyone that's had that question of what it is that we do, uh, we help sports organizations with their policy developments. We train coaches and trainers uh, that are on the sidelines. Uh, we provide a kind of a one-hour online course that gives them access to the app after they're done. They can set team lists, report injuries, um, all the things and features that go along with the technology piece. But really, the idea is complete. We are kind of trying to form the complete picture where we're helping the sports organizations, we're connecting with the trained clinics, um, and we're forming kind of local mini networks of various multidisciplinary specialists to kind of work together and uh, be on the same page. So anyone who's had that question, that is what complete concussion management is. Uh, last week, we did a trivia post about mouth guards, uh, and it actually got a lot of comments and a lot of people asking kind of follow-up questions to uh, the whole mouth guard issue. And so it's been kind of uh, an old wives' tale for many years that mouth guards could have some sort of preventative or protective effect against concussion injuries. Um, the research, unfortunately, hasn't necessarily shown that. So... Um, there was actually recently, which formed the Berlin Consensus Guidelines, but they, this, this one group uh, put together a systematic review looking at all the research around protective equipment and its ability to reduce the incidence or have some sort of protective effect against concussions. And they found that helmets 
uh, did not have any type of protective effect against concussions, um, unfortunately. And the other thing they looked at, they looked at tackling techniques. For example, if you teach people how to tackle properly, would that have a protective effect and reduce the incidence of, of concussions? And they found that no, um, it, it really didn't, uh, according to the studies that have been done so far. And that's not necessarily saying that it's not possible. It's just saying that at this current time, the, the studies that have been done show no reduction in, um, in concussions. Um, they also looked at mouth guards as one of them. And they found that overall the research was very mixed. You have some studies that will show that there is some sort of protective effect. You have a lot of studies that will show that there is no protective effect whatsoever. And so really we're kind of walking this fine line where we really don't know. We don't have enough information. And um, so as in, in terms of the best evidence we have, um, mouth guards may protect against concussion, but also may not protect against concussion. Um, and so I think the jury is still out on that. There have, there have been quite a few studies on that. Um, but at this point in time, mouth guards, we can't wholeheartedly say that mouth guards will prevent concussions or have any type of protective effect. Now, this isn't to say that you shouldn't wear your mouth guard. We obviously are very much in support of people wearing mouth guards. I think that it should be uh, a mandatory aspect of sport. It's just, I think that people shouldn't put the mouth guard in and then believe that they can do things that are more risky because they have a mouth guard and they might not get a concussion. I don't think that the mouth guard, um, just based on what it does, really will have any type of protective effect. Unless you get some sort of impact that comes right up from the bottom, uh, it may have some sort of reduction in terms of acceleration uh, to your head. But again, jury's still out on that. A lot more research is needed is, is basically the conclusion that we're at right now. Um, and then our final question is from, is this Callie or Cal? Cal on Instagram. Um, are there any good RCTs, so that's randomized control trials, um, looking at vestibular rehab for sports-related concussion where return to play is an outcome measure. And yes, there have been uh, a couple studies that have been done looking at vestibular rehab for um, return to play and seeing whether or not it has an effect. And the one study that actually was, was probably one of the, the best studies was out of the University of Calgary and Katherine Schneider's group. And what they looked at, uh, it was a small sample size. I believe there's only about 30 people within it, which is kind of the issue with a lot of these uh, more kind of manual therapy-based studies. It's a lot easier to give somebody a pill and somebody a placebo pill than it is to have a good quality randomized control trial where you're actually applying hands-on rehabilitation to an individual. And so their two groups, they compared people going through what they called at the time usual management, which was um, coming in, seeing a sports medicine physician, and then just going through kind of the guided return to play type steps, right? If your symptoms go away, you can move on to the next stage. If the symptoms come back, move back down to the previous stage, just standard return to play protocol. This was looking at people that were still symptomatic beyond a 10-day period. So at that 10-day, they would randomize them to either continue getting the usual care that they would get, and I think it also included some education in there as well. And then they had the other group get what they called cervical vestibular rehab. So it was a little bit of manual therapy of the neck, uh, some stretching of the neck, uh, some some. Um, some deep neck flexor type endurance stuff, as well as some joint reposition error uh, techniques, as well as some vestibular rehab. So it's a bit of a combination. I think that that's a key point to make is that vestibular rehab by itself um, won't have the same effect as vestibular rehab as part of a more comprehensive rehab package. There's a lot more to these injuries than just vestibular, and I think that's a big misconception. A lot of practitioners think, well, I have my vestibular training. That means I, I know what to do with concussion and the two are, are uh, there are some vestibular issues with concussions but there's a lot more to concussion than just vestibular so anyway this one kind of gives you that idea but so they did a little bit of circle spine and a little bit of vestibular and what the outcome measure was is they looked at eight weeks after injury how many players in each group had actually been cleared by the physician to return to play and what they found was that in the group that didn't get therapy the group that just had the usual care by eight weeks, only 7% of them had actually been returned to play, had actually been cleared. In the group that got the vestibular and cervical spine rehabilitation, 77% of them 
had been cleared. So almost 80% versus less than 10%, right? So initiating rehab in the early stages of concussion is kind of the way to do things now. We used to just tell people to rest and it would go away on its own. But we're really, what we're realizing is that actually initiating rehab early on uh, is potentially a lot more effective. And there was another study here. I'm just going to bring up my computer. But it was um, Renneker. Uh, Renneker in 2017. And this was, again, an RCT. And they were looking at initiating early treatment onset for people with dizziness. So people actually coming in. With the, main, with the main complaint of dizziness, and they had 41 people in this particular study. And so the group one was a treatment group. They got manual therapy of the neck again. So again, not just vestibular, vestibular rehab, as well as ocular motor and neuromotor retraining. And so again, here now this one's bringing in vision. So in terms of looking at pure vestibular, uh, there really isn't much. But in terms of looking at a multimodal effect, which is what we should all be doing, um, there is effect. So group one got the treatment. Group two also got treatment. So this is a good job in blinding because the group two got treatment, but it was considered subtherapeutic. So they were doing things that were kind of, you know, crap treatments and um, basically like a, um, a sham type of treatment. But the people in the group still thought they were getting treatment. So this is a good way of blinding the groups so that they don't know they're in the group that's getting the treatment or not. All subjects were seen two times a week for a max of eight visits. So if they're seeing twice a week, could be four weeks, or until they were cleared by the MD, whichever came first. And what they found was in the experimental group, the group that was actually getting treatment, the, the good treatment, that symptom resolution occurred two times faster in the group that was getting rehab versus the group that wasn't, or the group that was getting the sham. So it's not just the fact they're interacting with the physio, it's the fact that they're actually getting reliable, valid treatments that helps two times faster symptom resolution, and 2.9 times faster return to play clearance in the group getting treatment versus the group getting the sham. So there we have two pretty good studies, randomized control trials that, that show that initiating early rehabilitation is a lot better than just doing the wait and see approach of the past. And this is again getting back to the role of manual therapists, physiotherapists, athletic therapists, getting more involved in the management and treatment of concussion. And this is the whole idea behind our program is, is getting these clinics up and running so that they can work with local MDs to refer patients into their clinic to help initiate that early rehab, to help speed that return to play, to help get rid of those symptoms quicker. Um, and, that's, and that's really what our mission is all about. So those are the three questions for this week. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Next week, I will be in the UK, actually the week after. Uh, the first week of May, is it, Kyle? First week of May, second week of May. Uh, and I will be at the uh, speaking at the Elite Sport Expo and also the COPA series. The COPA series is for the healthcare practitioner side of things. Uh, for the sports presentation, I'm going to be covering kind of evidence-based concussion management programs for sports organizations, how to update your policies in light of kind of some of the new emerging research. And for the uh, healthcare practitioners, I'm going to be really getting into, you know, a lot of, you know, what concussion is, what's the evidence behind kind of some of the stuff that I was just talking about, how to initiate um, a program and implement a program in your clinic uh, from an evidence-based standpoint. Um, so if you are around, make sure you come see me there. Uh, we'll be there for a whole week, so maybe we can grab a pint after. And uh, for those of you that are not in the UK, uh, we might even throw it up on live stream on Instagram, either Concussion Doc or uh, at Complete Concussions. Uh, thanks again. That's been episode five. If you weren't able to watch us live, make sure you check us out on SoundCloud, YouTube, or iTunes.